Amen. If you've been here for uh, a while, you've probably heard me tell stories uh, about uh, a sister named Mama Ruth. Mama Ruth, right after I became a Christian, she was a, um, a, a sister that I met. She was um, some 99 years old when we first became acquainted in the nursing home that I ministered to on Sundays. And uh, Mama Ruth, she, was, uh, she, she stood out for lots of different reasons. She was a, a joy. Uh, I could tell stories on her all day long. But one of the things that I most remember about Mama Ruth is that whenever I would preach, <laughs> a lot of people were snoozing, which, by the way, nursing home ministry is a wonderful preparation for ministry because half the people are sleeping and most of them don't remember what you said, and it's just okay, and praise God, and we're just trusting God to work in the moment. But you could tell when God's word would go out, that it, it hit Mama Ruth, and she wanted it to hit her. It's like she would come to the sermon and say, hit me, Lord. And she would sit there in her wheelchair, and her heart would be open before God, and you could hear when, when something would come in, and it would, it, would, it would strike her soul, that she'd go, mm. She'd go, mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she was going in because she was listening. She was receiving the word. But for her, it wasn't just a receive the word and then wheel back off to her room and then go about her day. I would stop by her room afterwards and she'd say, now remember that thing you said? Here's what I need to do about that. Or that was right. Or maybe that wasn't so right. She had a few of those too and that was helpful also. But it, she always was thinking about how the word was supposed to change her about sins that were exposed while the word was going out that she needed to confess, about ways that she needed to wheel down a few doors and apologize to somebody she was nasty to, about ways that she needed to forgive past hurts that she remembered in the moment as the word was being preached. Mama Ruth came because she wanted to do business with God and she wanted God to do business with her. She knew the word was doing work. And this morning, as we come to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9 and, and following, we are going to see that this is what God's Word is doing to God's people. God's Word is doing work on them. They have been receiving it now since chapter 8, after the city's been rebuilt and the, 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 the temple's been rebuilt, the, the wall has been rebuilt, and the people have gathered together since chapter 8. And three times we see the book of the law has been open, and as it's gone out, it's hit the people which is a sign of God's mercy, that it's not just falling on dead ears, but it's landing on their hearts, and it's affecting them, and it's causing them to, to respond. We've seen that in three movements. Uh, last time that we were in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 8, we saw how they responded with celebrating the, the, the Feast of Booths. And now we jump into the story here in, in chapter 9, where they are just a couple days after the Feast of Booze being celebrated, and now the word is going to be read again, and they're going to respond once again. And if you want to summarize what chapters 9 through 12 is really all about, you could, could maybe do it like this, that God's people must respond to God's word with confession, commitment, and celebration. God's people must or ought to respond to God's word with confession, commitment, and celebration. This is Nehemiah chapters 9 through, through 12. We're going to have three points, if you will. The first is confess to God. The second is going to be commit to God. And the third is going to be, want to guess? That's right, celebrate before God. Very good. So, Confess to God. Now, full disclosure, chapter or uh, point number one, confession to God, chapter nine is the longest, okay? Um, so uh, we're, we're going to summarize more of chapters 10 through 12 as we work through, but chapter, chapter nine, we're going to go in on this idea of confessing to God. This is going to run chapter nine, verses one through, through 37. Confess to God. Let's look at verse one. Now, in the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth or dust on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. 
And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. So this, this reading of, of God's law, as we've seen throughout the book of, of Nehemiah, has been central to this revival of, of God's people. This, again, is the, the third time we've seen them huddle up around the law in order to, to receive it. We saw that in chapter 8, verse 1, chapter 8, verse 13, and now here in chapter 9, verse 1. And, and when God's word is read, God's people are fed. And we see them coming once again for a, a feast. And it's by feasting on the word that they are going to grow in spiritual maturity. And I'm not sure if you caught it or not, but they were, um, they were there for a while. They, they came for an all-day sort of feast around God's word. A quarter of the day here is, in the way that they would render it, is, is three hours. For, for three hours... All the people were standing. Imagine standing. Do you know they used to stand during the sermon? And the preacher used to sit? <laughs> Somebody up and fixed that, didn't they? <laughs> so I don't know who it was, but praise God for that person. <laughs> but, but it used to be like that, and that's what they did. They used to stand to read the Word, and, and then, and then the, 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 the priest would have been, been reading it. But three hours here, they're standing while the Levites are reading the Word, and then they're like, all right, now it's time to live it out. So then they have three hours more of responding to it. And I think that is what we see summarized in the rest of chapters 9 through 12. What it looked like for what were they reading? Well, we're going to see in the rest of chapter 9. And how did they respond? All the rest. Did you notice there they are crying over their sin? You see that there? That they, that they, as God's word came upon them, they have sackcloth and earth on their heads. This is a, a symbol of, of mourning before God. They, they've been moved. They've been moved by what they've heard in God's word. And this, by the way, is one of the clearest evidences that God is working on someone's heart, is that they see their sin. And, and they're grieved by their sin, not just by the consequences of their sin. This is ruining my life. I lost my job. Nobody will talk to me anymore. This friend, blah. like that's all very horizontal. But what's got them, if they've gone vertical, and all of a sudden they've realized that the God of heaven has spoken and they've sinned against him. And they are grieved vertically. They're crying over their, their sin. Then also you notice here they have consecration from sinners. They, they are separated themselves from all the foreigners. Now, at first glance, that may not sound good. This is, this is not, however, some sort of holier-than-thou self-righteousness. But this is setting apart themselves from, uh, from the, 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 the people of the land in which they were entangled and ensnared with all sorts of wicked practices. They were saying, we are going to be, we are set apart from that, and we are here to worship the Lord. And then we have the confession of, of sin. As they hear God's word and they're grieved by God's word and they set themselves apart from the things that were grieving God, they then confess to God. To confess simply means to agree with God. That God says, when you sent that text message, when you made that post, when you said that word to that person, you were slandering someone. You were gossiping. You were lying. And when God's word shines in and you see that, you say, yes, Lord, you're right. Rather than make excuses or blame somebody else, or well, they started it, I was just there, like whatever. Rather than making excuses, you accept it and say, yes, Lord, you are right. I have sinned. We agree with God. That's what confession is. That what God's word is, tr we say that it's true in the way that it's landed on our, our heart. And notice here, they've they're confessing their own personal sin and the people's sin, both individual and corporate. They've seen their greed. Even Brian, I thought, did a wonderful job of, of walking through many sorts of sins that are represented even in this, this room today. And I trust that as he prayed, some of us felt those sins in our own lives being exposed. That's what happens when God's word is proclaimed and, and prayed. 
So they are moved here with crying and consecration and confession of their sin. That's going to characterize everything that follows. Verse 9 now. On the stairs of the Levites stood eight men, and they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Verse 5, and eight other Levites said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. So what you've got here is that after this word is being read, and probably even while it's being read, you have these, these two groups here. One group of the Levites directs their pleas for mercy to God. They say, congregation, cry out to God for mercy. Somebody, somebody stand up and say, Lord, have mercy on me. I was harsh with my children. Somebody else stands up and says, I was unfaithful to my spouse. Somebody else stands up and says, I have slandered many of you. Somebody else stands up and says, I have lied. Lord, have mercy. That's what they're crying out for. God, have mercy on our, us for our sins. And then a second group there is directed to, is directing the congregation to stand up and bless the Lord, to, to praise him. To, to bless means to show favor. Oftentimes we think about God blessing us, which is, is right and good. We desire God to show favor to us. But the way we bless God is showing favor to him. Saying, God, there's no God like you. A God who, who doesn't deal with us as our sins deserve, but shows mercy and kindness and patience. Bless your name. So you've got this this ministering among the people of God as God's word is falling upon them and the leaders are standing up and they're saying, confess where you've fallen short and then thank him for him, him giving mercy. This is worship here. This is revival. They're not in here arguing about carpet colors and whether we should paint the parking lot and whether we should do this. Like that's not what's, so their, their minds are set on things that matter eternally because God is working in their midst. Now, what could produce that sort of work? What, what, what could do that in the people? Well, chapter 9, verses 6 through 31, we see a prayer that was being prayed that was saturated with Scripture. We have a 31-verse prayer that is blessing God by chronicling the, the history, basically, of the world and of Israel all the way from creation all the way up to that very moment. And, and there's two major realities that are on repeat the whole way through this prayer. Reality one, God has always been faithful. God has always, always, always only been faithful. And secondly, we have always been unfaithful. We have always only ever been unfaithful. We might get it together for about six minutes, and then somebody cuts us off, and then it's over. Lord, I'm yours. Get out of my way. Like, whatever that is, it's, our unfaithfulness is evident. And what he does here is he chronicles that for us. Now, one thing to note as we read through this is there something that shows up 57 times throughout this chapter? It's the word you. Their eyes are on God. You have done this. You have done this. You have done this. It's a God-centered prayer. They have a big view of God. Now, verses 6 through 8, he begins in Genesis, where God created the world. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. So they start all the way at the beginning. They say, you are the creator of the world and you're the sustainer of the world. But not only that, you also called out Abram. Verse 7, you are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of the Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you, and you made with him the covenant to give his offspring the land of the Canaanites and all the other ites. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. They start this 
this recounting of the book of Genesis, saying you are the creator, you are the sustainer, and you are the covenant initiator. You are God, you, you are God who makes promises and keeps promises. And he goes back to this first promise that God made with Abraham of land, seed, and blessing. I'm going to give you a place where my presence and protection will be. And I'm going to give you seed. I'm going to give you offspring. I'm going to give you people. We're going to fill this up out of the, the barren womb of Sarah. We're going to make a whole nation miraculously. And I'm going to bless you. I am going to shower my goodness upon you in a way that all the world will see that there is a God who is worthy of worship because of how I'm going to deal with you. He says, you did that, Lord. You made a, a promise because you are righteous. So this covenant God is being praised for will be their hope. Land, seed, blessing. He is the promise maker and he is the promise keeper, which, by the way, is the only reason that they're still alive to be having this combo. The only reason this little Bible conference is going on right here in Jerusalem in chapter 9 is because God made a promise and kept a promise, not because they were so awesome that they kind of kept it together until they got there. God had made a promise. Verse 9, we move to the book of Exodus. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea, and you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people in his land, for you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone in the mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses, your servant. And you gave them bread for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock of their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. God, you're the creator, you're the sustainer, and you're the savior of your people. They praise him here for the salvation that he brought for them in the midst of their utter darkness. In their darkest hour, he intervened in a way that has forever been famous. He split the Red Sea in two. Don't ever get over that. Like, God... <laughs> God made an ocean split in two, which is either total lie and absolute nonsense that we should all just dismiss and go home and do something else, or it's a testimony that there's a God who made the world and is sovereign over it and can do anything to save his people, like splitting seas or raising people from the grave. He can do that, and he did it there in such a way that we still talk about it thousands of years later. But not only was the year their savior, he was also their sustainer. He guided them with his presence. You've got the cloud and the fire. He, he gave them his precepts. And you notice there, it called the good law, the good word. The commandments of God were good. Why? Because God did not just leave us down here in the darkness to try and figure life out, just following our heart off a cliff. No, we have a good God who says, there is a way. Let me tell you, let me tell you what's true. And what's not, he gave his word. And he also gave the provision of bread and water. If you want to summarize it, you can just say, God has only ever been good to them. He's saved them. He's sustained them. He has been good to them. How should the next bit read? And they responded and said, Lord, we are yours. We will follow you forever. The Bible would have been a lot shorter if it was like that, but it's not. Verse 16, we move from Exodus to the book of Numbers. But they, well, the end of Exodus and then the book of Numbers. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously, and they stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. Verse 17, they refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. Do you see that? They weren't mindful of the wonders that you worked. They're like, Red Sea, yeah, whatever, but... 
But they stiffened their neck, and they appointed the leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. We don't want Moses over us. Get somebody else. We want to go back to where we were in slavery because it was great back there. We had a better buffet. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them, even when, verse 18, even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies. You, in the face of their great blasphemies, you and your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. How amazing. How amazing. First, the, act- the insanity of the people of God, to see all that God had done for them, and then to just say, you know what? We just want to sin. And then the inconceivable mercy of God, that in the face of their blasphemies, setting up other idols and saying, "Now nah, this is our God. He says, no, you are my people. And he remains faithful to them. Israel responded to God's goodness by rejecting his precepts, by rebelling against his provision, and by replacing his presence with idols. It's interesting, the word gave, I'm not sure if you've noticed, it's going to start showing up a bunch of times all the way through here. It's translated a little different in different uh, translations of the Bible, but 19 times in this chapter, the word gave is there in the Hebrew. 17 of those are of God giving. God gave a name, he gave a covenant, he gave a land, he gave signs, he gave commands, he gave bread, he gave water, he gave victory, he gave goodness. uh, 17 times he gave stuff. Two times the giving is of Israel. And you know what they gave? They gave rebellion. They gave rebellion. God gave provision, mercy, grace, love, Goodness, again and again and again, and all they kept saying is, ah, we want a different God, thanks. They have stick, stiff necks, disobedient hearts, blasphemous tongues, but you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake them. In the face of our evil, God continues to do good. This is called mercy. This is called grace. Grace and mercy are two friends that often travel together in the kingdom of God. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. They are friends, and they are evident here. That they didn't get the wrath that they deserved, but they kept getting the grace that they didn't deserve. God was so kind to them. So much so that even while they were wandering around because of their rebellion, he didn't let their shoes roll, uh, wore out. Forty years, they got the same kicks they went in with. <laughs> they didn't even need to go to Foot Locker. The, the Lord just, he provided the whole way. He cared for them, sustained them. And then he took them into the land, verse 22, book of Joshua. You gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted them every corner, so they took possession of the land. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and to possess. You subdued them, verse 24. Uh, you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land and gave them into their hand, verse 25. And they captured fortified cities and rich land and took possession of houses full of good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. They ate and were filled and became f- fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. He says, let me give you another evidence of God's goodness to you. We got the land of promise. 
God, continue, he, God had promised he's going to give them a land, and he brought them to the land. He judged the idol worshipers who were there and gave the land to the rightful owners, to the people of God, because it was God's land in the first place. He, they, they received an abundance of goodness that they didn't earn or deserve. And as they enjoyed its goodness, what it should have done was point them to the God who was good to them. This, by the way, is how life is supposed to work. Scriptures say every good and perfect gift that comes down to us comes from the Father of light in whom there is no variation or a shadow due to change. That means every good thing that's ever happened in your life is because God has given it to you. You're supposed to interpret all of life like that. So when you see a sunset, what you're supposed to do is pause and to say, thank you, God. You're an artist, and you did it again. Thank you for making a world where there's colors. When you walk into a room, like I walked in last night, and smelled popcorn, you're supposed to say, Lord is good. Imagine a God who makes smells like popcorn. If you hate popcorn, whatever your thing is, but like you smell it and it smells good. Or when we sing, there's a God who, who, ha- who gives sounds that are pleasant. Every good thing that we have is intended to be a signpost to the good God who gave it to us. But that's not how it landed on them. Verse 26, the judges and the kings, nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back. It's like they got it, they're like, I don't need that. They killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you, and they committed great blasphemies. I'm not sure if you've noticed, by the way, how how personal all of this is to God. If you receive the law, it's equated with receiving God. If you reject his word, it's equated with rejecting him. In case you're new to, 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 to Christianity or learning what it means to follow Jesus, you've got to understand, Christians are not just people who have a bunch of arbitrary rules that kind of fell from the sky or that we made up to kind of keep ourselves out of trouble, but rather, the scriptures are God-breathed words that we look to that tell us who God is. So when when the scriptures say you shall not lie, the reason isn't just because it's not helpful for you when you lie, but rather it's because God is always true and he never lies and we're created in his image. So when we speak, we're supposed to image what he's like. And when we lie, we lie about him. And that's personally offensive to God. That's why everything that we say and do matters is because we're representing God. God says, my law is not just some arbitrary thing. You reject it, you reject me. Sin is a personal offense against God. And they're seeing that here. Verse 27, and there's consequences for it. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you, and you heard from heaven And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of the enemies. These are the judges in the book of Judges. Verse 28, but after they had rest, they did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and they cried to you, you heard from heaven, and as many times you delivered them according to your mercy. Time after time they rebelled, and time after time, God gave them over to their oppressors, yet every single time that they cried out, God counted, countered their oppressors who oppressed with saviors who saved. God continually raised up people to deliver them. Why? Because he wants to do good to his people. That's what he loves to do. He loves to do good to them. The Garden of Eden was created. Eden means delight. It was the land of delight. He says, the whole thing is yours. Every tree, it's all yours. Enjoy it. There's one, though, don't touch. It's not good for you to know the difference between good and evil. And we're like, oh, we'd like to know what evil is. Please tell us. He goes, you don't want to know. You don't want to know what the Taliban is. You don't want to know what... what cancer ward is. You don't want to know what betrayal is. You don't want to know evil. And Satan says, oh, you'll not surely die. And we're like, yeah, let's, t- let's listen to the snake. 
and we dismiss God and all of his goodness in order to follow our own hearts straight to hell. Yet God in his mercy time and time and time and time and time again has been nothing but good to them, pursuing them. Nevertheless, I don't even know what verse I'm in. Verse 29, you warned them in order to turn them back to your law, yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commands, but sinned against your rules, which were, uh, which if a person does them, shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their necks and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your Great mercies, verse 31. You did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Can you not see how patient he has been with them? Mercy after mercy. It's impossible to miss. And look, we got the cliff notes of this. We got the spirit-inspired summary. They're doing this for three hours. You're like, was this hot in there? Is it in here? I don't know. They didn't have AC, so probably... But they're here receiving this. And verse 25, his great goodness stands in contrast to their great wickedness. Why does he do good? Verse 31, because you are a gracious and merciful God. It's who God is. And this is what moves them to hope. Because here they are back in the land. They still have enemies surrounding them. They have this whole history of God only ever being good to them in the face of all of their sin, and they stand there knowing, oh goodness, we don't deserve God to do anything good to us, and we still have enemies who are all around us. What's going to happen to us? But the testimony of God's past faithfulness instructs them to have hope for the future. And so they pray. Verse 32, now therefore, O God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us. Verse 33, yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully and have acted wickedly, meaning we've deserved every bit of the discipline that you've dished out. You've done no wrong in punishing us. You have, as I think it's Ezra or somewhere else, you have punished us less than our sins deserve. Is that in Ezra? That's in Ezra. So it's there. You have punished us less than our sins deserve. That's how he treats us. That's how he's treated them. God has been merciful. Verse 35, even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them and in large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. We've only ever been apathetic or antagonistic, God. Verse 36, behold, we are slaves to this day in the land you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves, and it is rich. Its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. So what they're saying is, yes, Lord, we've been able to come back to this city. Yes, we've been able to rebuild it, and that is a testimony to your goodness to us, but we are still surrounded by enemies. We're still under Persian rule. God, help us. Our enemies are all around us. And they bring their distress to God. They confess their sin to him. They confess their need of him. And they had hope that God had showed mercy before, so maybe he would do it again. So in all of this, what they've seen is God's been good in, in, the, in spite of our, our sin. God, do it again. Do it again, Lord, one more time. Please play it back one more time. Mercy, please show us mercy. As I was reading this, I couldn't help but think last night as I was going back over, I could not help but think that there's got to be some of you who came in here this morning who look at your life and just think, I messed up too much for God to ever do anything good for me. I've strayed too many times. I've sinned so much. If anybody knew what I'd done, they wouldn't even let me in this place. And you look around, and you feel like everybody here probably has it together on some level. And you just think there's no way that God could ever, ever receive you unto himself. I want you to know that no matter what sin you have that you can't shake, or burden you carry that you can't take, 
the good news is that there is a God who loves to give mercy and that he never, never, never once gives it to people who deserve it. This room is not filled with a bunch of people who have it together. They may dress up nice, but, but God knows we all bad messed up in here. Nobody struts in this building who is aware of who they truly are before God. But rather, everybody comes in here keenly aware that Israel's story is their story. That they have strayed and wandered. That's the story of everybody. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Listen, this points us to the good news that is the story of all stories. The greater story. The story of Jesus. All the echoes of the Old Testament find their place in the person of Jesus. You see, Jesus is the reason that we're here this morning. He's the hope that they needed. They didn't know him by name, but they knew a God who would give that kind of hope. We now know the name of hope. His name is, is Jesus, God's son, who came and lived perfectly obedient, unlike Israel, unlike us, who never stiffened his neck in rebellion, who never shrugged off a command with apathy and threw it over his shoulder, but rather lived perfectly who loved perfectly, obeyed perfectly in all the ways that we fall so short of. And then, you know what we did? What Israel did? The same thing they did to all the other saviors that were sent, who were images and shadows of the great savior. They killed him. And they put him on a cross. And they tortured God's son to death. We did that. They did that. With our sins, that's what we did. We rejected him. You know what? It was part of God's plan. He died. Christ died so that we would not have to. Christ suffered so that we would not have to. Christ went into the grave so that we would not have to. Because three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. Listen to this. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When Jesus comes out from the grave, he declares the good news that the cross was for you if you're a sinner. If you will but humble yourself and turn from your sin and trust in him, it's where all of your sins can be paid in full. And then he rose from the dead to say, condemnation does not have to rest upon you. But in him, if you are with him by faith, you will be made alive. In this life and in the life to come. You see, if you've come in need of mercy, you've come to the right place. Not because this place is special, but because our God is special. We have a God who deals richly in mercy. He's got storehouses full of it. You can't exhaust the riches of his grace. That's good news. It was good news for Israel, and it's good news for us. And as they became aware of that, what it did was it moved them from confessing all of the sins that they had done against this God and pleading for his mercy, and then it moved them to point number two, a shorter point, to commit to God. To commit to God. Confession to God about our sin now leads us to commit to God apart from our sin. That we want to follow him in faithfulness. This is going to run from chapter 9, verse 38, through 12, 26. So the only right response that we could have, that they could have, to the tidal wave of God's mercy is to completely commit ourselves to God. And that's what they do. If you have a Hebrew Bible, you'll notice that there's no chapter 9, verse 38. The, the verses and chapters aren't inspired. They were put in later. It would be chapter 10, verse 1. But most of our translations have chapter 9, verse 38, being the final verse of chapter 9, and it says this, Because of all of this that God has done, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. So upon hearing the story of God's mercy afresh, and hearing how faithful he had been to his covenant with the people, Nehemiah and the other leaders here publicly renew their commitment to the covenant that God had made with them. Okay, so what they're not doing here is starting some new religion, with starting this new covenant. They're renewing their faithfulness to the covenant of the God who has been faithful to them. 
And then they all sign it. And you'll notice there in chapter 10, verse uh, 1 through 27, you've got a list of 85 names. You can count them. 85 names of leaders, priests, Levites, and ministers who publicly signed the covenant renewal. And what's the first name on the list? The Herbie Hancock, the John Hancock, just kidding. Some of you understand that, some of you won't. John Hancock, remember when he signed the Declaration of Independence, the first one, big, everybody could see? Who's the first name on this, this list, this Declaration of Independence from Sin? Who is it? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. He steps out and he says, I'm going to write my name down. He says, I am leading the way in this devotion to, to God. No more idolatry in this place, he says. Which I think just by the way, I want to say fellow elders, fathers, spiritual leaders in the home, spiritual leaders in this, in this congregation, there's a responsibility that leaders have to model faith. Not perfectly, but courageously. Those who took a stand for God, they, they didn't do it alone. The Lord was with them, and he was their strength. This took, this took courage in the face of all the nations that are still around them to say, we are going to align with our God, and we're putting our, name, we're putting our name out where everybody can see before God and before the people and before the nations to say, we're with him, no matter what it costs. This is something believers do even today. Some of you will have seen in the news in regards to what's happening in Afghanistan. Several months ago, before it was known as to what would be going on now, there were 50 Afghan families who were Christians who decided that on their, on their, their national ID, which requires you to publicly say what your religion is, that they were going to publicly change it from Muslim to Christian, which is, I mean, we have no idea what social pressure is like. I mean, this is, this is potentially signing you're your up for martyrdom. Because they wanted, they wanted to make a statement in their day that we are followers of Christ and we are going to follow him. And they had no idea, though God did, what was coming for them. Today they're in great danger and I ask that you would pray for them. For those who are, are still there, I know some are trying to get out, would you just pray that God would show mercy to them? When they signed their name and they said, we're with him, they did not do it alone, and they are not alone even now. They publicly posted their name to say, we have faith in Jesus, and God has inscribed their names in his book. And they're going to, he will be with them, and he will be faithful even unto their death, if it's what it calls these, these people here had a similar sort of declaration that publicly says, we're with God no matter what the cost. The people then follow the leaders, chapter 10, verse 28. The rest of the people and all who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, and all who have knowledge and understanding join with their brothers and their nobles and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe all the commandments of the Lord, uh, of the Lord our God and his rules and his statutes. So that now you have this entire community of God's people Men and women, young and old, everybody who could understand publicly entered into this oath to obey the law. And you have these, you have these kind of these, these groups here. And it's, it's what we're going to see here and later on in the last chapter that we're looking at today, chapter 12, you have these, it's an echoing of Joshua chapter 8, which you can go back and read later where you had the people of God separated into two groups on Mount Gerizim and Ebal, and they would read back and forth the, the blessings and the curses as a way of dedicating, saying, we're, we're with this covenant. It's kind of a replay of that, that happening there. They are returning to God and repenting of their, their sin in three key areas, and I'm going to try and summarize these here for you. This is verses 30 down through 39, but they're recommitting to God in regards to their relationships in regards to time, and in regards to money. In verse 30, relationships. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Now, we studied in past weeks, this has nothing to do with, with interracial marriage. 
This is inner religious marriage. They are swearing to not marry unbelievers because as they do, their hearts will be united with the gods of those, those unbelievers. It's been all the way through history. This is the fact. They say, we, will, we commit to not doing that any longer. So our relationships, Lord, we dedicate them to you. We also do that with our time. Verse 31, if the people's land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy for them uh, on the Sabbath or on a holy day. So here they, they promise to honor the Sabbath, which is the, the sign of the Mosaic Covenant. They are going to cease their work on, the, on, the, on the, the seventh day, and they are going to center their hearts on God and rest in him. So their relationships and their time, they said, Lord, it's yours, and then their money. Verse 32 through 39, basically summarizing, they say they're going to support the Levitical ministries with the tithe, with the Old Testament required, and the first fruits are going to bring God their best. Verse 39, they say, we will not neglect the house of our God. Basically, the people had gotten greedy and stopped giving to the work of God, and it was slowing down the work of what God had called them to. And so as they hear God's word, what it does is it convicts them of lots of things, but here, of the way they're doing relationships, what they're doing with their time in regards to the Sabbath, and what they're doing with the money that God has entrusted to them. And they say, God, have it all back. We repent and we recommit to doing it in a way that's going to glorify you. Now, sadly, as you're going to hear next week, chapter 13, this doesn't last very long. Uh, Jason's going to tell us that actually all three of these areas, they're going to fall right back into their sin. So, sorry, spoiler alert, but come back and be miserable with us next week. Um, Chapter 11 through 12, 26, I'm just going to summarize basically here. Since the nation has repented and recommitted to God, they're now going to repopulate Jerusalem. All the leaders are going to be there. Then they're going to cast lots and a tithe of the people are going to move in. Chapter 11, you've got the list of the people who lived in the cities and then in the villages. Then chapter 12, verses 1 through 26, it recounts all the priests who were in Israel during this time. And and in all of this, what we've seen is that they are hearing God's word. It's led them to confess, and now it's led them to commit. As God's people hear God's word, it is not intended to just be like, okay, we made it through that. It's intended to be received and to be considered and then to be applied in specific ways that God's spirit shows his people both individually and corporately. That we see his faithfulness, we see our failure, and God, now we confess it and we repent and we recommit to you to follow you. This is what Israel did, and it's what God's people are called to do. So they confess to God, they commit to God, and then thirdly and finally, they celebrate before God. Chapter 12, verse 27 through 47, they are celebrating before God. So repentance from from sin that's been committed against God and rededication to living for God results now in celebration before God. Verse 27, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgiving, and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. Nehemiah says, all right, y'all, it's time to get the band back together. All right, we are back in the land. Strike up the band because we are going to praise him. He brought us back here. We suffered for so long, and now we are back, and we are going to celebrate what God has done for us. This wall that they have recently rebuilt, it symbolizes God's presence and his protection. He's brought us back to the land. He has given us his presence again. He's restoring us. And now they're going to sing about it. Which, by the way, is another sermon for another day, but have you ever just thought, how amazing it is that there's a God who makes music. And this is a part of what he prescribes for his people to regularly be doing is to sing. And if you study, you'll see that songs have infused God's world from the creation, says the angels were singing there, all the way into the the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth. We're going to be singing forevermore. God is a God who has always has the music on. He gives the gift of music. 
because it helps his people express in a way that's, that's, that's filled with both joy or sorrow, depending on what the song is like, the feelings that they have that are associated with their experience of God working in their lives. Well, verse 28, and the sons of the singers gathered together from the districts surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages, verse 30, and the priests and the Levite purified themselves and purified the people and the gates and the wall. The people here gather and they prepare to worship God by purifying themselves. This is a sort of a, a ritual cleansing that involved their confessing sin, putting on fresh garments, washing their hands, anointing all the instruments that would be used in worship. They are all external symbols that are intended to communicate an internal devotion to God. It's similar to things that we should do as God's people. So, for instance, God's people to be consecrated now, first and foremost, we come and we confess our sins and say, Lord, forgive us. We are covered in the blood of Christ. He washes us clean from our sins. But then as we prepare to gather here, the night before, well, the night before we get a good night's rest so that we would be attentive as the word is preached and not weary because we stayed up all night. We will have come in having read the text so that we're familiar with it and we're looking to see things that we had already learned explained better. We will have maybe sung the songs that we're going to sing today. We'll look at the playlist that, that, that the church has, puts out every week and says, hey, these are the songs we're going to sing next week. Then we listen to it and get ready so that we are come in and we know these songs. We've come with our sins confessed. We come having reconciled with people that we, we might have disagreements with. We come set apart from sin and to God. It's a similar sort of posture that we see them cultivating here. Then verse 31, Nehemiah speaking, he says, Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. Verses 32 through 37 of chapter 12, we see one choir led by Ezra go to the north side of the wall carrying instruments. Then verses 38 and 39, we see another choir led by Nehemiah who went to the south side of the wall and they, they, they basically set up surround sound in the city. That you've got, you've got choirs on both sides of the city singing about the glories of God, giving thanks for what he's done. They've all rallied together here at the house of God to give him praise. Verse 40, so both choirs of those gave thanks, stood in the house of God. They offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made with them, uh, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. What a picture. This is what God created Israel to be. A city set on a hill filled with worshipers who are set apart from sin and dedicated to him, singing with joy because of how good God has been to them. And what is it that fuels their song? His mercy. This whole testimony that we've just heard, he's been merciful in the face of all of our rebellions. They've seen the greatness of their God and the severity of their sin, and they've received the balm of mercy. That's what moves you to celebrate. It's God's mercy delivered to you. Now this scene serves as a shadow of what the church is to be. And there's differences and similarities. And in conclusion, I'm going I'm to share that with you briefly. The, the difference, the primary difference between what we see happening in 9 through 12 here is that Israel gathered under the Mosaic Covenant where their blessing was based on their obedience to the law. We rather today, if we, we who are in Christ, we gather under the new covenant, where our obedience is not what brings our ultimate blessing, but rather it was Jesus' obedience. He's the one who was the better Adam, the better Israel, who kept the law fully, perfectly, died on the cross to pay for all the ways that we didn't do it, rose from the dead, and now for all who will turn from their sin and turn to him, he will credit the righteousness that he deserved to our account, and we now stand complete in him, forgiven, justified, his righteousness credited to our account. We are free. So we come today under a better covenant. 
We can sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. We don't come in here under the threat of condemnation because we know that Christ was condemned in our place. We don't come in here under the threat of exile because we know that Christ was exiled in our place. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that in him, by faith, we might become the righteousness of God. So we come here knowing there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't come offering up sacrifices of bulls and goats because Christ was the greater sacrifice. But in that, we learn that now our bodies are to be living sacrifices. We, by his spirit, now we receive his word, confess the ways we repented, and now confess the ways we've sinned and repent of it so that now as we go out, our lives are living sacrifices. And also, we are not geographically limited. They were in a, the holy city of Jerusalem, but under the new covenant, there's no longer a holy city or a holy place. Even this building, it's not a holy building. It's a building where the holy people of God gather to be equipped and then to, to scatter and fill the earth with worshipers of the one true God. So that's the difference. We gather under a different covenant. But the similarity is this that God's people must respond to God's word with confession, commitment, and celebration. So individually and corporately, let us read God's word. And as we do, let's confess his faithfulness and confess your unfaithfulness. Do this personally and privately, but then also do it, do it together. Make this a corporate thing with other believers. Read God's word, and as you, de- you do, Commit to obey what you find. So my prayer today was that everybody would hear something that they could take from today and apply it. This is always the prayer. As you come, do you in your personal devotions, as we gather together corporately, come and say, God, give me one thing that I can take that you want me to live out after this. And then we do it, remember, from having been accepted. We don't do it to be accepted, but we do it from having been accepted. Grace is the springboard for our obedience. And we do this in the context of of community. So I encourage you today, examine your relationships. We will commit to not engage in relationships in the way the world does, whether it be slander or gossip, competition, rivalry, tribalism, territorialism, abuse, anger, whatever it, it may be. The people of God are to say, we're going to do relationships differently. With our time, we're going to not use it as the world does. For us, the Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ. He fulfilled the law. But this is the Lord's day. This is the day that Christians have for 2,000 years celebrated. So we gather. This is his day. Let it be for him. But then let us remember that every day is for him as well. Examine your time. Are you using it for him? Same with money, that we don't want to use it as the world uses it. We don't want to pursue it in the ways that the world does with greed and dishonor. But we save it, we spend it, we share it in ways that honor God and further his mission. This is what they did, and we are to do the same. This, by the way, would be great conversation over lunches and in the days ahead. Let's talk about those three areas. How are you doing according to God's word? What are areas that you can confess? What are ways that we can pray for one another? And as we read God's word, we celebrate his goodness. We do this as we gather and as we scatter. One way I want to encourage you to think about doing this is to come back tonight at 5 p.m. Tonight we're having a unique service called Burdens and Blessings. Some people last week thought we said Bourbon and Blessing. That's a different service, but um, (laughs) Burdens and Blessings um, tonight, um, which is going to provide a unique opportunity for a handful of the, the members of the church are going to stand up and they're going to testify about things that that God has done in their life through some very hard circumstances, some through some very just joyful circumstances. But we're going to testify about what God has done and and show how there's words from him that we've held on to. And we're going to pray for one another. We're going to sing together as an opportunity to remember that in the midst of our unfaithfulness or the unfaithfulness of people around us in ways they've hurt us or just having been in a world that is cursed by sin and the pain that's there, that we still have a God who's ever faithful. And we're going to testify about that tonight and encourage you to consider that. But that's just one way that the people of God can be marked by this sort of response to God's word. So I encourage you in the days ahead, let us be a people who, as we respond to God's word, that we confess our sins, 
we commit to him and we celebrate his goodness, particularly in sending Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we pray that now we would consider it. And Lord, that we would do it with an eye toward that day when the Lord Jesus will return and we will go into a land where we will forever be remembering your mercies and celebrating the way that you delivered us from sin. That we will always and forever be singing about it. Oh, Father, would you give our, our hearts sobriety before you? Would you help us to, to see sin, to turn from it? And Lord, would you help us to help one another to do that until we see you face to face? Oh, God, give us grace for your glory and for our joy. We pray in the name of Christ.